Hey everybody, welcome to Life is Brutiful. Today we're going to be doing the second episode of 2019, This Week in Beer. This is the segment of my channel where we go through and we talk about some of the biggest hard-hitting news stories in the beer industry and everything relating to beer, home brewing, and all that jazz. So, first off, before we get into the news, I do want to say, last week I promised that we were going to talk a little bit more in depth about the Brewers Association's decision to change craft beer, and I promised a video this week on it. It kind of turned into its own unique crazy monster and uh, what was going to go from a simple like five minute rant turn into uh, one of my lengthiest scripts of all time. I think we're sitting at around eight to nine pages worth of research and information dating all the way back to the 70s. So if anybody was looking for that, uh, sorry, it will be out very soon. I promise I've already started on the pre-production and uh Hopefully I'll be able to get that out to you soon. Anyways, let's get into the news. The first story this week is a bit interesting to say the least. Court documents have shown up in Pennsylvania detailing a lawsuit, a uh, some court filings from Hill Farmstead against Tired Hands Brewing. The filings claim that in 2012, prior to Tired Hands initial release, there was a small investment made from several members of the Hill Farmstead to include Sean Hill, the notorious, infamous owner and founder of Hill Farmstead. The investment was worth a total of around $15,000 in exchange for 0.15% equity into the fledgling brewery. And this was on the terms that the investors would be able to sell back their shares or the brewery would be able to buy back these shares at a minimum of a 50% increase within five years or after five years. However, Hill Farmstead claims that they haven't received their money. They haven't gotten adequate pay repayment for the money that they invested into Tired Hands and hence the lawsuit. The documents go on to say that the Tired Hands party tried to pay off this debt back in 2017 with an offer of $7,500, which would roughly equate to the 50% profit. However, the Hill Farmstead investors turned down the offer and claimed that it was far below fair market value of what that investment was worth. This is seemingly based off of a 2011 email from Tired Hands to their investors when they were trying to seek investors, claiming that investors would be able to see a minimum of a $5,000 return on top of their initial investment of $5,000. So they were basically promised a 100% increase if Tired Hands was able to reach at least half of their projected growth goals, which based off of their well-renowned esteem and their super hyped beer releases, it seems like they've actually met all that. In fact, here's some statistics coming from the Brewers Association's reporting on Tired Hands. Combining those things with Tired Hands' plans for expansion in the near future, it would seem that those goals have been met, those terms have been adequately satisfied, and that they should have been able to return the full amount of the investment plus the $5,000 that they promised in the initial investment, you know, fishing line where they were trying to pull them, in, pull them all in. And that $7,500 offering seemed to be a harsh lowball. The Hill Farmstead investors are now seeking an undisclosed amount of compensation. And they're also alleging that there has been a slew of illegal activity on Tired Hands part to include federal securities law fraud, unjust enrichment, foregoing fiduciary duties, breaches of Pennsylvania and Vermont laws. Additionally, another issue arose during this business transaction where the investors were made unaware of the fact that they would be held liable for the taxation on said profits if they were to make any. Because of this and a law degree apparently held by one of the top upper management people and tired hands has led Hill Farmstead to claim that it was gross negligence and uh, abuse of law. So there's some pretty heavy charges being levied here. Now it needs to be said that reportedly this court case was initially filed in Vermont and it was dismissed with prejudice. And according to a letter from 
the Tired Hands people to Good Beer Hunting, the, the beer news website, they said that it has also been dismissed with prejudice in Pennsylvania. Yet, as of reporting on this, there has been no documentation to verify that is true. Now, my two cents on this whole matter is that I really do think it's really sad because I hate seeing two really well-renowned breweries that are held in extremely high esteem amongst the community go at each other like that. But I cannot lie that what Tired Hands seems to be doing, if everything Hill Farmstead has alleged is true, it's a bit shady. I think it's incredibly shady to try to withhold money if you owe it to somebody, especially if that money that was given to you that you owe was given to you in order for you to build and establish and open up your business, you know, that is a dream come true for many people. And for them to take that money, build an incredibly successful operation out of it, and then not return the money and try to lowball them, it's insulting. But if everything that has been said in this statement is true, I do really hope Tired Hands does the right thing and I hope that they pay Hill Farmstead what they're owed. It would just be the right thing to do and it could possibly save one of the most well-loved beer bro ships in the entire industry. I mean, if you've ever had a collaboration between Tired Hands and Hill Farmstead, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They make magic together. and It's sad to see them on the rocks, so. Hopefully this all gets sorted out as amicably as possible, but uh, I will keep you up to date if anything changes in this, so stay tuned. Moving on to beers that have been announced or released this week, I saw a pretty big influx of interesting experimental beers that have been released internationally all across the globe, so I kind of wanted to focus on them a little bit since usually America is always coming out with something crazy and getting all the headlines. So let's show a little international love here. One that I found incredibly interesting was coming out of the Netherlands. Lowlander Brewery, which is a very botanical based brewery. They try to do as much as they can with local ingredients and wild grown items. They have decided to brew an IPA, a 5% IPA brewed out of juniper and recycled Christmas trees. As a part of their no waste campaign where they try to brew as efficiently as possible with as minimum negative effect to the environment as possible. And in this they have collaborated with several different facilities and industries all throughout the Netherlands to be able to incorporate and get their hands on a bunch of old Christmas trees that were just going to be thrown out and they used the needles, the needles, whatever, to <laughs> brew this IPA. Lowlander Beer released this statement. Every December about 2.5 million real trees bring Christmas spirit into our homes. By New Year most of these end up in the chipper on by fires or piled at the roadside. We have found another use for them in beer. So that sounds absolutely delicious, and I think it is a cool and interesting cause to try, you know, cut down on environmental waste and, you know, continue to recycle and be innovative in your brewing passion. So huge shout out to them. I uh, I now live not too far away from there. I was actually up in the Netherlands uh, in the Holland area not too long ago, so I can't wait to be able to get my hands on this. So I'll let y'all know if I do. The next beer announced this week was coming out of Iceland, and. If you've never looked into Iceland, I highly encourage you to. It is definitely on the top of my most desirable travel destinations because they are they got some nice ass beautiful scenery going on there. And now it seems like they got some great beer coming out too. Iceland's regional budget airline, Iceland Air, has decided to partner with an Irish brewery to release a private label line of IPAs and other drinks to serve to their customers mid-flight. The 5% private label IPA, which I can't even come close to pronouncing, it sounds like they're gargling marbles in Iceland when they talk. It is translated roughly to mean like Iceland snow glow or something like that, very rough translation. But this IPA is brewed exclusively with a heavy, heavy dose of very interesting American Hops. We got Azaka, we got Mosaic, we got uh, a whole bunch of interesting flavors. And it is also brewed with a unique American hop strain that will be infusing it with flavors of pineapple, mango, and passion fruit. So I'm extremely interested in it and I definitely want to give it a try. 
I absolutely love the fact that a company is investing into beer and using it as a tool to be able to encourage consumers to come into the local economy. This is capitalizing on beer tourism at its finest. And I like to see that people are viewing it less of a hobby and more of as an actual travel incentive. And I think that's uh, pretty dang cool. So good on Iceland Air. Plus, I really like the fact that a budget airline is taking this much effort to, you know, enhance the flying experience. I don't know if you've ever flown on a budget airline, but uh, they're usually pretty bad. Now, this last one isn't necessarily a beer that was offered, but it is an opportunity to get free beer for a year. Goose Island has decided to rally behind the Chicago Bears NFL team after a disappointing loss where their kicker missed a 44, I think, yard field goal attempt. And it felt really bad for him when I read the quotes, man. He was really beating himself up over it. And uh, it didn't help that everybody online was just talking massive shit. And everyone was like, oh, I can do it better. So Goose Island has decided to call out these armchair kickers and has started talking some absolutely hilarious shit on Twitter. Their plan is to construct a field goal out in front of their brewery and allow people to come up and try to put their money where their mouth is and make that 44 yard field goal and if they are successful in doing it they will be able to win one year worth of free goose island beer now i'm not the biggest fan of goose island but i do like that they are uh sticking up for their local home team you know I, that's uh you got to have that hometown passion you got to work together as a community to be profitable and everybody work together so i do really like when breweries you know work with the local community also, I like it when people get put in their place. So anyone out there who thinks they're all hot shit and are able to compete on a large scale like this, here's your chance to step up and prove it. So if you're in the area, I highly encourage you to go out and give it a try. Please, please send the videos my way because I would love to see everybody out there uh, being extremely athletically gifted like they claim they are online. And shit, even if you weren't one of the people heckling the uh, kicker, it's still a good opportunity to possibly make you know, a year worth of free beer, save you a little, uh, a little beer money. So eh, it's worth a try. You never know what can happen. Miracle. Now the last story this week is actually a little bit sad and it's not just one story, but it's actually an accumulation of several different stories coming out of California detailing how the beer industry, especially the craft beer industry is on a downward trajectory. And, uh, some of the harsh stories coming out of it, uh, really puts into perspective how this industry is reshaping itself. Or the worst. First off, Hangar 24, a pretty well beloved and widely destroyed brewery, has announced that they are going to be laying off 42% of their brewing capacity. And that's in addition to a complete restructuring, which will hopefully allow them to remain in business and remain independent. Breweries in the area have seen a great deal of success coming out of taproom sales and out of limited brewery only releases, but many of the distro based business model breweries are facing huge, huge uphill battle because people just aren't buying beer as much as they were. The boom is starting to die down. So to compensate, Hangar 24 has announced that they're going to be doing a complete leadership overhaul and that they're going to be trying to redirect their business model a little bit away from distro. So I don't know exactly what they're planning, but hopefully it'll be enough to, to keep them steady and keep them stable enough to remain in effect and remain in production. So here's hoping to them. Additionally, this week, Almanac Brewing Company, one of the best utilizers of local produce and fruits and their sour beer program. I absolutely love their beers. They announced that they are going to be closing their San Francisco based tap room. Now it is important to note that this was not a forced closure, but instead their lease was coming to its natural termination and they decided to not renew it in order to refocus their efforts and their resources towards something that could be seemingly more profitable, which is their uh, mainline brewery in Alma, Alameda. I don't know how to pronounce that. California's got a bunch of weird word towns. But what's so interesting about this is this is a continued trend of seeing breweries 
really start to refocus and restructure themselves away from expansion and really try to solidify their central hubs in order to maintain profitability. It's almost like they're, they're, they're gathering nuts and trying to hold them closer to their chest to survive a harsh winter as this market just continues on a really sharp downward trajectory. And it's really sad to see these stories coming out of California because since craft beer in America's conception, it has always been one of the best destinations, one of the central hubs of innovation and growth. And it's kind of scary to think that if one of the strongholds in American craft beer is seemingly shrinking so drastically that all these breweries that have seen such massive growth in the past are starting to shudder and falter, it kind of paints a very bleak picture for what the future of craft beer is across the nation. It really helps put in perspective just how sharp the bubble popped. But maybe there is some hope out there. Well, at least for some of the older legacy brewers. A campaign was initiated this week by renowned craft beer journalist Stephen Balmont. He is aiming to try to rally interest in some of America's most influential and well-known flagship beers who he fears is at risk of going away because of the way the industry is projecting itself away from flagships and safe beers and heading towards more exclusive one-off and experimental brews. He's calling this initiative the Flagship February Movement. Hashtag Flagship February. During this initiative, uh, he's really trying to push how American craft beer was built off of a lot of these old legacy breweries, and that includes Sam Adams, Sierra Nevada, and you know, all the old classics. And that how without them, the beer industry, the whole landscape just would not be what it is. So in this downward trending market, we need to try to show them a little more love to keep them afloat. And I have some interesting thoughts on that, but I think it would be way too much for this video alone. So. Prepare for another video in February about flagship February. Now, it has gotten a lot of traction on social media. We've seen a lot of people discussing it online on Twitter, Instagram, and all that. And there has been a decent amount of response coming from the community where we've seen tap rooms across the country decide to offer deals and discounts on these flagship beers throughout the entire month of February in order to gain interest and revitalize uh, people's willingness to step away from the crazy experimental one-offs and head into a little bit of classic American craft beer. So maybe this could be a push towards the right direction and maybe it could help the craft beer industry uh, get a step up, at least maybe a little itty bitty one. But I do want to know what you think. Do you think that we should try to revitalize interest in these old breweries and these older flagship labeled beers? Or do you think that we need to adjust ourselves and prepare for the future of what craft beer is? And that seems to be really experimental, really hyped up, limited beer releases out of tap rooms. I'm interested to know what you think. So thank you very much for watching everybody. I hope you enjoyed this week in beer. If there were any new stories that came out this week that I did not cover, please let me know and I will try to do it due justice. So thanks for watching everybody. Like, comment, subscribe. Cheers.